<laughs> Thanks. Hi, everyone. Hi. Uh, thanks for having me and, and us. So I'm Hosey. This is Andrew. Uh, we're gonna, we thought this was going to be a fireside chat, so it made sense for us to both have a chat. Uh, but we found out this morning it was a presentation, so uh, we wrote a presentation this morning. And you're going to start with uh, presenting. Yeah, so um, I don't know who knows us and who doesn't know us. Um, uh, hopefully most of you do by now. Um, Vice over the last few years has become one of the biggest producers of original video in the world. And I think right now we're uh, the biggest producer of original uh, video for online on the planet, making 6,000 pieces of content a day. Uh, which we just distribute around 36 countries. Because we do so much video, we're going to show a little bit of video in this presentation, so roll BT. Shane Smith is here. He is the co-founder and CEO of the international media company Vice. He wants Vice to be the next CNN, the next ESPN, and the next MTV digitally. You've also said you want to be the Time Warner of the street. We already are the Time Warner of the street. Vice magazine, which started in Montreal in 1994, it's become a global empire. You got Vice.com, international network of digital channels, TV production studio, a record label, an in-house creative services agency. You can describe the Vice brand. What is it? Vice is the voice of a generation. The world's first truly global, multi-platform youth media company. Vice delivers hours of original video content every day, covering the news, culture, and entertainment that define the world we live in. Everyone was investing platform, 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 money into platform, but no one was saying, well, what are we going to fill that pipe with? Vice is a network of channels, each geared to the passions of young people today. Noisy has quickly become one of the biggest music channels on the web. I'm a do me, and I'm a be me. Motherboard documents the present and future of science and technology. Thump is a total immersion into electronic dance music. The party goes on. The Creators Project is a celebration of art and creativity. This is for the globe. An ID brings together the worlds of the runway and the street. Munchies is defining a new era in food program. Oh, so good. Vice Sports, coming soon to Europe, is a fresh take on the culture of sports. And Vice News is immersed in the stories behind the headlines. Chaos. It's hard to work out what exactly is going on. Now, with the Vice series on HBO winning an Emmy, deals struck with major television networks the world over and long-standing partnerships with YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter. Vice is creating the best original content for every screen and platform. Reaching hundreds of millions of young people every month with unprecedented levels of engagement. Young people today have been marketed to since they were newborns. They've developed the most sophisticated bullshit detectors of all time. And the only way to circumvent that bullshit detector is to not bullshit. The people who shoot it have to be young. The people who cut it have to be young. The hosts have to be young. So if something is created in a boardroom, it will not work. Vice and its growing network of channels is defining the future of news and entertainment for young people everywhere. There's a changing of the guard every generation in media, and we are the changing of the guard for Gen Y. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, so Shane at the end there says, uh, well, the change of guard of, of media for Gen Y. Why are Gen Y important? I'm sure a lot of us have seen the stats, but the largest generation in history, 1.8 billion people globally. And or secondly, that are now, this year, be going to become the largest consumer group in history. So $2.45 trillion worth of purchasing power, uh, the biggest in history, and obviously the key for sustainability for a lot of our businesses, and that's why they're important. But if you like, consider this. A 21-year-old uh, today, this year, was born in 1994, which is 12 years after the first mobile phone was, uh, was put on the market. And there hasn't been a time in their life where they haven't been able to search for something online. So I think we've all seen these stats, but they've, also gr they've obviously grown up in a, in a mobile, always connected world. But they've also grown up in a different world as well, um, based around two big narratives of, of, of culture. Um, and these two sort of narratives and pathways are the crisis of information and the liberation of information. And what do we mean by that? The crisis of information, if you look at the 2000s, they were bookmarked by three really huge geopolitical events. Um, the war on terror at the start of the decade, um, climate change throughout and ongoingly, and uh, the economic collapse at the end of the decade. Um, and when you think about these, this crisis of information, when you think about what the casualty of this crisis was for this audience and these young people, um, it's trust. So trust has gone, really, and, uh, in, in government, in experts, in institutions, in co and corporations. And most importantly for us, and, and, and very acutely for us, in, in media, there's a, a, a lack of trust. Um, and so when you look at the sort of the three things, you look at the war on terror, was the media co-opted on weapons of mass destruction? False equivalence in global warming, 98, 99% of scientists agree it's happening, but the media portrays it 50-50. And then on the economic collapse, you know, at best, at best it's complete ignorance. At worst, it's greed and corruption and so on. So it's no wonder that there's a huge amount of lack of trust happening in this audience with traditional forms of information and traditional forms of media. But the good news is that at the same time, the same time as the crisis was happening, there was a liberation of information. So bandwidth, obviously we all know about that, free flow of information, social media, peer-to-peer -peer recommendation and sharing, and obviously everyone in this room knows about mobility or being always on. So this uh, liberation was happening at the same time with this crisis, creating a whole new trust ecosystems and way of displaying information, a way of getting information from um, different sources other than the traditional media, which is obviously in the time that Vice flourished um, and Vice grew massively over this decade uh, with this audience. <laughs> so yeah, and as, as you all know, the, the audience during this time developed an incredibly sensitive bullshit detector. So they can see through anything that happens in this world and publish it back to the world, creating a, a problem for media, creating a problem for brands, and I should say an opportunity more importantly. So how did Vice flourish in this time we've been called anything from the we've been called a millennial whisperer by the New York Times how do you actually get through these times what do you need to do we've asked our own audience we've did some research and why they come to Vice is because we offer stories you can't get anywhere else yeah I mean this is a, such a key thing we do huge amounts of research and everyone asks us what the secret is and what happens yeah. and how do you do it and the same thing comes back just offering a unique perspective and telling the stories that other people aren't telling in a world of absolute commoditized information and commoditized branding and commoditized everything, uh, being unique is key. Yeah, and especially when you compare to, to all the content, as Andrew said, that's out there compl uh, currently with the keyboard cats and everything, what you need to search for is trust and credibility. And content, video content that we do is the differentiator that will set you apart. So um, what... Sorry. No, go ahead. But, Okay. <laughs> but just in, in, I guess the point I was saying, like, this world is that unlimited content. Content's an overused word. How do you differentiate your content? How do you make it premium? How do you make it stand out? How do you use it in a good way? Um, it's about it's real storytelling, and that's how you differentiate. What does premium mean? It's stuff you can't find anywhere else. And this is what we've got to do, because everything is being arbitraged. Everything is being... Um, Technology is, is driving the content ecosystem and real storytelling sometimes isn't. And that's the sort of core difference of what we do at Vice is uh, we make stories that you can't find anywhere else and everyone should try that as well. It's a harder road, but it's the road that we have to travel. 
And essentially it comes down to what's the saying, making an impression, or creating an impression, making an impression, make something that people care about, get angry about, react to, get happy about, tell their friends about. And once you do that, like what Vice has done, we're the most engaged platform pretty much in, in across all of these on YouTube with a 99.99 percentile of most engaged, most watch time um, out there. Snapchat, we've just uh, been one of the partners for Discover. Um, millions of video views every week, and most importantly for us, uh, the most watch time on, on Snapchat. So what we've been doing, we've been taking all of our learnings for the media companies, and for this room, we wanted to talk a little bit about what we're doing in the mobile space for mobile brands, wanted to be specific to the audience. So one of the things we're doing in the US is we're the millennial agency for AT&T, so we make the advertising, we make content, uh, we make the social platforms, strategy, all of these type of things. Everything, yeah. Everything. Everything. Anyway, we'll show, you, we'll show you some of the work that we've been doing. AT&T partnered with Vice to connect with a new generation of mobile consumers. Together, we created the Mobile Movement, a groundbreaking multi-platform program and advertising campaign celebrating mobile life and innovation. We traveled across the country listening to the stories of young Americans and found out how their phone and the AT&T network are changing their lives. I'm a millennial, so, you know, we document our lives. Fast Company said, all of the work bears a youthful confessional vibe. AT&T is able to humanize what they offer as a brand. And the New York Times called us millennial whisperers. AT&T's The Mobile Movement reaches the mobile generation through advertising, documentaries, animation, scripted films, interactive events, and digital conversation. We launched the entire program at a massive South by Southwest event, featuring interactive installations by young mobile innovators. We wanted to take a stage projection and give audience members some way of interacting with it. A series of commercials featuring real young AT&T subscribers communicating AT&T's products and services. You start talking months down the road. That's too far ahead for me. It's kind of hard to be flexible when you're stuck to a two-year contract. <laughs> Documentaries took viewers on journeys through generational insights. We cast real young people who varied in age, gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, and personality, tapping into insights and truths that resonate with people from all cultural backgrounds. My phone is everything. It's perfect. I need it. I drop it a lot. Mi familia extensa vive en Paraguay a través de mi móvil. Estoy conectada con ellos. My phone's my life. I hug it like it's my girlfriend, man. I can just cut it love with it. The best stories we heard we turned into cinematic short films featuring high-profile talent in the network diaries. In collaboration with Vice's technology channel Motherboard. We took a dive into the future of mobile technology in our series, Upwardly Mobile. On our constantly updated Tumblr page, you'll also see a steady stream of micro content, spotlighting relatable and funny mobile moments. To date, our program has over 1.1 billion impressions, including a 14% shift in target intent to subscribe. Our YouTube page has over 14 million video views to date. On our Tumblr page, we have over 83 million impressions and 3 million shares and engagements. We had 15,000 attendees at our South by Southwest event. <coughs> and there's more to come from the mobile movement in 2014. So this is something we can do for brands, and we've, we're taking our method of creating great storytelling and place it into their ecosystem. Obviously, this isn't a vice-branded thing. This is something that we do as a service for for this company, and, and it's worked incredibly well, and we can learn a lot of lessons from it. But I think what, what the best sort of partnership, and one of the things we're trying to push into now, is working with major brands, actually putting our brands side by side in a, in a totally integrated way, uh, so we can get larger distribution of what we do into the audience, um, and they get uh, the benefit of, of talking to the audience in the way that they need to. So we're just um, launching a, a program with Rogers in Canada, which is a full brand partnership, putting up our, I don't know if the Canadians are over there. Um, uh, a full brand partnership, putting our brands together side by side and really redefining what it do, a media partnership is uh, with, with a client. We're going to show one more video and then we'll have some questions. Yeah. 
Today, Vice and Rogers are proud to announce a groundbreaking new media partnership that will revolutionize the way that Canadians will access Vice video content across all screens, mobile, web, and TV. Born in Montreal 20 years ago this month, Vice is coming home. There's about 200,000 people in the square who are going to try not to get arrested. At the heart of this homecoming is the creation of a state-of-the-art multimedia content production studio. Launching in early 2015 in Toronto, the new studio will be a hub for Canadian creativity, a purpose-built home for the next wave of Canadian journalists, producers, directors, and editors that deserve to be recognized on the global stage. Vice has been creating content in Canada for years. May Day has a long revolutionary tradition, and we want to remind people. Do you think there is a marijuana lobby at this point in Canada? I think all that corporate money is very good. I didn't think this was going to work. We're kissing the stars, and we're listening to some hot tunes coming from Montreal, Canada. Thanks. With this new production studio, Vice will be creating much, much more. Holy fuck. Not only will the studio make content specific for a Canadian audience, but more importantly, it will produce video and editorial to fuel Vice's growing global network of online channels in 36 countries. The studio will create content across all categories. Everything that is important to young audiences everywhere. It's really a human condition. This love for the culture that you come from is very inspirational. For audiences on mobile devices in Canada, the studio will create the first ever Vice Daily Video Show. Vice will publish a must-have daily show that will define the most important news and culture stories for young Canadians that day. Et une présence d'Al Qaeda qui est quand même pas des moindres. Cette fois, c'est clair. Là-bas, on est au bord du chaos. Finally, as another pillar of this partnership, Vice will create and launch a 24-hour cable channel distributed across the country by Rogers. The Vice television channel will debut hundreds of hours of new primetime original series and specials made in the new Toronto studio and around the world. Today, a new chapter in the history of Vice begins here in Canada, and young Canadians from Vancouver to Halifax are invited to join the unfolding story. Okay, so that, that's what we're doing in Canada. It's a huge partnership, and it shows what we can do globally and what we can do locally at the same time by combining efforts. And what, would, what part of the reason we're here is we're, we're talking to various partners and building studios in the rest of the world too. So we're uh, uh, building them in different lo locales around the world and um, looking for the right partners to work with. So um, that's it for the video and the, the presentation. Uh, we've got like six, seven minutes for questions. So anyone who wants to ask a question, that's why we're here. Thank you. The microphone thing. Do you need a microphone? This. Hi there. Hi. Um, Hi. Great Hi. presentation. A uh, quick question: um, How are you managing sort of balance between keeping provocative and independent? with the growing corporate partnerships? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's the biggest thing when we come in that we, um, you know, anything that has the Vice brand on it, we have total credit, creative control and editorial control of everything we do. Like we said in the start of the presentation, it's all about the content yeah. and making the content believable, authentic, real. Um, and if you don't have that, then the partnership will fail. So that's, that's the number one stipulation. I guess specifically I was talking about with your news storytelling, which is often in some cases having to challenge some of the positions of the partners themselves. Yeah, I mean that editorial independence is, is, is what it is, so you have, to, you, you have to stick to your guns and if there's a real story, you have to tell the real stories, we can't, we can't compromise on that ever. We do it all the time. Okay, thanks. So. Hi, um, that lady's question was my question too, so I'll ask you something different. When you're talking about real storytelling, how, how do you define that? What is real storytelling in the context of 
everybody telling stories now? Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it, it's, a, it's a challenging question to answer very quickly and succinctly. I think for us, what we always try to do is tell the stories in the language that the audience talks to each other in, um, rather than lots of media is done in this kind of voice of God way, where it's like, we, we are right and we are telling you what is happening, but they're not, often not even there. So what we do in our news coverage, is, which is very key for us, is always to go there. So we're not doing studio shoots, really. Uh, we're not standing there with an expert on one side and an expert on the other. We're actually getting into the field, immersing ourselves in the situation and telling the story from the inside out. And I think that's the, the, that's the, the core thing that differentiates ourselves. Is this, we have 3,500 contributors around the world who are in the field who can get into a situation as quickly as possible. So it's all about immersing with the subject and talking about it in the language that the, the audience talks to each other and not uh, censoring the language, if you like, and trying to create a, a system of formatting. Um, that people know is kind of bullshit. And so uh, if you can get around that, then people will be, you've become more believable by actually doing what you say on the tin. So it's just about actually doing what you say you're doing. All right, that, this one, this young chap. Hi there. There's a couple of questions I'd like to ask. The first one is, how do you, ex I mean, there is many different audiences around the world, al although they are millennials all the time, and how do you adapt your language, not to the uh, mental structure of these guys, but actual, actually the cultural differences between countries? This is the first question. And the second one, when do you expect to launch Vice Sports globally? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a great question, and I think this is, something we did very early on um, when we were growing Vice. We made sure we had real local offices with uh, local editorial, local production, local editors, local producers, local everything, um, who could uh, learn from our tonality and our underlying uh, mission statement of how we want to do things, but tell the stories locally with, in, in local language. And so we have 36 offices now around the world. And uh, as we staff up in all of those offices, what we want to become is the place where everyone knows they can come and tell their stories if their stories are interesting and the stories that can't, can't be told. So we want to tap into, in every country, the young creative class, the young people who've got ideas, the young people who feel disenfranchised, the young subcultures, and give them a platform that's bigger uh, that they give them a global voice on. Um, so that's really important that we can act locally. And I think you know, some major media companies made a misstep that way. Um, you know, MTV you know, started shoving, you know, teen drama and my Super Switch 16 down everyone's throats and they're a very good company and I shouldn't single them out, but, you know, sometimes those things aren't relevant in different countries. So the over formatting of television media in terms of the risk averseness of making the same format everywhere, um, I think was sensible uh, uh, economically, but ultimately culturally is not working and that's why the rise of Vice has happened. Um, on your second question, Vice Sports. Uh, April. Next month. Next month, late April. Yeah, that's the plan. Uh, he's got it. Hi. Yeah. Well, I, I would like to hear um, uh, more about your plans in Latin America. I come from Mexico, and we hear uh, uh, a lot of, uh, of buys uh, things over there. So I want to hear something about it. I mean, if you're uh, maybe uh, looking for a partner over there. Yeah, you should come talk to us afterwards anyway for a longer conversation, but I'll... Yeah, no, I there. mean, it, it's, a, it's a massively important market yeah. for us. We have offices um, uh, in, in, uh, in various countries, and we're looking to build up that infrastructure uh, massively over the, the coming months. I think you're right. I think the, the media is, is somewhat tricky there sometimes, especially in the news media and so on. I think there's room for... Uh, a new, new fresh voices and um, we have a, a, a good solid operation in, in some of the countries but we're looking for partners now to really accelerate what we're doing and we're in discussions with various people some of whom are sitting in this room and smiling at me um, but yeah we would uh, we'd, we'd love to talk and the last one H how far do you think you can uh, get into the in the media world how, how far do you think you can be in five yeah. or ten years well, I think this is, this is important because, you know, we get asked the same question, a similar question to we got asked first, is as you get bigger, 
do you sell out? Do you, if you partner with big corporations, you know, can you, can you, can you keep your edge and so on? And um, how do you stay cool and all this stuff? And Vice from day one, if you actually look at the press from the early 90s and mid 90s, we never, we never ever wanted to be cool because cool is a byword for small. We just want to be good. And we, wanted to, we were driven by the, the lack of good content that was coming to us. We didn't want to watch what was on TV. We didn't want to read what was in the magazine. So we wanted to create something that we wanted to read and we wanted to do and we wanted to watch. And I think that's, that's kind of the world over, that people have that same feeling that it's not the things that they want to watch. So we want to become the biggest youth media company in the world and the biggest youth media company in the world. And it might sound ridiculous, but um, it's less ridiculous now than it was five years ago and less ridiculous now than it was 10 years ago. And um, we're just going to keep growing. Ultimately, we just love producing stuff and we love making content. Yeah. And anyone who loves making stuff, we want to come and work with us. And uh, that's how we want to grow. Just one uh, comment. Um, it's been said before. I'm here. Hello. <laughs> I'm out there, out there. Here. Here I am. <laughs> I think it's been said before uh, already, but um, you've got a great origin story and a fantastic brand. As soon as you start talking about AT&T and the content that you're showing, you trigger the exact button with me that you're trying to avoid. And um, I, think, I think that's really tricky. That's just, just a co comment. And there's one uh, other request. Can you promise to not tap yourself on the back in the future like CNN does? That's basically it. OK. Yeah, promise. Thank you. <laughs> we'll <do> Noted. <laughs> yeah. That wasn't a question. That was an instruction. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hi, uh, great talk, first of all. Um, I was wondering, now, uh, Vice, you're building a great media company, a universal uh, media company, but you still have the brands beneath uh, Vice, the sports, the, the music. Yeah. Um, in your distribution, now with Snapchat, you have Vice as a whole uh, on, dis on Discovery. Are you looking to, to fragment the, the sub uh, parts of Vice and in the distribution? Or you are always presenting it under Vice, the umbrella. For instance, would you, would you be interested in the sports network and having the sports yeah. powered, yeah, uh, the content yeah. powered by? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. Um, yeah, look, at actually, within, within, if you look at the Snapchat Discover platform, you can all go on it now and look at what they're doing. We have six to eight pieces of content a day, and each piece of content is under one of our verticals, so branded one of our verticals. Uh, the verticals allow us to go deeper into every, all the subject matter that we're interested in or our audience are interested in, so we want to build out those, those channels and those brands massively uh, in some of the, the core areas that we're working on. Uh, you've noticed Vice News, for instance, we wanted to brand Vice and Vice Sports brand Vice, so uh, there's some areas where keeping the Vice brand firmly on it, and we're integrating the brands into the other ones, but building out those brands like Noisy is becoming a, a huge music brand, and that's going to grow massively this year with some partnerships we have, and Motherboard and Science and Tech, you know. People didn't come to Vice for science uh, content, so for us to rebrand something with Vice's tonality, but on that subject matter, to give it a separate voice, made sense. Yes, um, great presentation. I'd like to know your plans towards um, coming to Africa, like Sub-Saharan Africa. I'm from Ghana, um, because um, the technology space is really um, growing very fast, and I think this is a time that Vice, um, your expertise would be good for some of us. Uh, for instance, I'm in the field of mobile gaming, and gaming is very young in Africa with um, culture, African culture, creating superheroes out of African culture, Shaka Zulu and the rest. So I think this will be the good time to dive into Africa so that four years from now we can talk yeah, okay. um, about uh, African technology here. Thank you. I mean, yeah. for, for, for sure. I mean, it's, it's, we've, we've been talking about it a lot over the past couple of years about how we entree into the market in the right way. Uh, we've, we're already setting up small bureaus for Vice News um, in, uh, Laos and Nigeria. In, in, yeah. in Nigeria and Kenya, as well as obviously in, in South Africa. Uh, but yeah, it's, it's incredibly important. We haven't figured out the roadmap yet. And if you know anybody or you can help, or you can have some partners who can help, we'll, we're, yeah. we're all ears. I think that's it, they're cutting us. We, I, think, I think we're out of time, so we're going to get kicked off. But thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. Thank you.